On tonight's Monday Night Travel, we're joined by tour guide Nico Favorio as we explore the Flanders region of Belgium. Starting in the city of Bruges, we'll take a trip to De Kerst for some seaside fun, remember the lessons of World War I in the fields of Flanders, and visit Nico's hometown gem of Kortrijk. Thanks for joining us. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Monday Night Travel with Rick Steves Europe. My name is Gabe Gunning, and I have the privilege of serving as your host this evening as we explore a small corner of a small country that has had a big impact on European history. It's West Flanders. Now, without further ado, I would love to welcome our guest for the evening as we explore this charming and often overlooked corner of Europe, uh, West Flanders, and our guest is Nico Favariel. Nico, welcome to Monday Night Travel. Hello, welcome everyone. Hey, Gabe. So, Nico, you were with us in January for the Festival of Europe, um, talking with Rick, um, celebrating both Belgium and the Netherlands. And since then, you've been very busy touring. Can you tell us which Rick Steves tours you lead and how the season has been going so far? Um, yeah, it's been a busy season. Uh, great so far. Uh, we've had uh, the Belgium and Holland tours uh, in uh, March, April, May. Uh, that, that's when most of the departures happen because of the springtime. Uh, the flowers, people book it to see the flower gardening in the Netherlands. So I did the three of the heart of Belgium uh, and uh, Holland in um, a row. Uh, oh, wow. And then now I'm off to a season doing the best of Switzerland in the summer. And uh, I later this year, I'll do uh, Munich, Salzburg, Vienna and the best of Paris. And again, the heart of Belgium and Holland. Yeah. Oh, wow. I, I didn't know that you were such a versatile tour guide, Nico. I didn't know that you actually did such a, a wide variety of our tours. Um, but that's fantastic and fantastic that you've already been able to cycle through Belgium and the Netherlands a few times this year so far. Yes. Yeah. The weather wasn't so cooperative, but um, <laughs> it's still a very nice uh, region to visit any time of the year if you come in even if you come in uh, November or February would be you, you can still enjoy the cities that we have um so uh yeah it's uh, it's just uh, so that that um I think maybe because of my language skills that I'm put into France and Germany and then the combination in Switzerland of French and German as well and um I'm lucky you know yeah and as are the tour members that have you as their guide. Um, so Nico, I need to start out tonight's show with a, a confession, which is that I have been to the Netherlands, I've been to Belgium, I've worked at a European travel company for years, and I still feel like I don't have an excellent grasp of what Flanders is. It's one of those things that I feel like has gone on too long and I'm embarrassed to ask. But since we're talking about it tonight, I was hoping that you could start out tonight's show by telling us what is Flanders and where is West Flanders? So uh, West Flanders is a province in Belgium and it um, uh, Flanders as such is, to put it very easily, it's the Dutch speaking part of Belgium. It's in the north. Uh, you can see it here. Um, the yellow marked area is, is where Flanders is. It has the cities of Antwerp, Ghent, Bruges. And then in Belgium is split in, in, in three regions. Um, one is Flanders, the yellow part. The uh, red part is the French speaking part of Belgium called Wallonia. It's a bit bigger in size, but it has a, a lesser population. And then you have a region kind of surrounded with, with Flanders, and that's Brussels, which is a region on its own. Um, and, and this is uh, the, the reason why it's sometimes confusing is because we also have three linguistic uh, communities in the country here. The, the green one is the Dutch-speaking community. The, the red one is the French-speaking community. And the blue one is the um, German-speaking community because German is an official language. And then you can see that Brussels is has both colors because it's a bilingual region. So Flanders for for quite it, it could be a few things. It can be a regional uh, the region that I just pointed out. It could be a historic 
a county of Flanders, which was quite important um, in the past, uh, from the 12th to the 16th century. That's that's kind of the peak of, of the importance of the county of Flanders, which kind of spread also towards France and the Netherlands. But if you Google Flanders, uh, you don't get any of these maps, but you <laughs> get uh, the neighbor of Homer Simpson. <laughs> so that's why for some people it's quite uh, uh, difficult. It's not an independent region. It's just part of, of uh, Belgium. It has its own government, and uh, but it's uh, it's part of Belgium, and it's the Dutch-speaking part of Belgium. And what we're looking at here is the... Um, is well the Lone Star uh, state almost. <laughs> it's one of the ten provinces. It's in the west, and so the province is called West Flanders, which uh, uh, is a Dutch-speaking area within Belgium, and it has several tourist um, destinations. Not only for people from Belgium, but uh, also from people from abroad, of which uh, Bruges is the most famous, and then the coastal area, the coast. Of course, everybody thinks of when they hear Flanders, they, they often think about the First World War as well. Uh, the, the Flanders fields, that's an area where you have a lot of battlefield grounds from the First uh, World War. And then you have an area uh, on the Lys River, which is a, an important uh, river that uh, starts in, in France and ends up in Ghent. And along that river, you have a lot of industry and a lot of history. And Kortrijk is uh, basically a city on the Lys uh, River. Well, Nico, thank you for that explanation. It was very clear. I I feel much uh, clearer on what Flanders is now. And I did not realize that there was a German-speaking portion of Belgium. So you, you learn something new every day. Um, yeah. And we are going to get started now with... Um, probably the the most well-known place in West Flanders, and that is the city of Bruges. Um, and to start out, we are actually going to have Rick take us through the city of Bruges. Um, we're going to watch one of his clips uh, from his time in Bruges. Um, and then after we wrap up in Bruges, Nico, you very kindly have gotten <coughs> a lot of great photos and video content for us in other areas of the province of West Flanders. So we're going to start in Bruges with Rick, and then we will expand outwards to some hidden gems in West Flanders. Here we go. We're starting in Brugge, as the Flemish people who live in this part of Belgium call their town. The French-speaking half of the country and English speakers call it Bruges. However you choose to pronounce it, it comes from the Viking word for wharf. In other words, it's been a trading center for a long time. About a thousand years ago, the city grew wealthy as the most important textile market in Northern Europe. Back then, the city's canals provided merchants smooth transportation. Today, they provide visitors smooth photo ops. A short cruise shows off the town's old wealth. By the 14th century, Bruges' population was 40,000, as large as London's. As the middleman in sea trade between Northern and Southern Europe, it was an economic powerhouse. In the 15th century, while England and France were slogging it out in a hundred years long war, Bruges was the favored residence of the powerful and sophisticated Dukes of Burgundy and at peace. Commerce and the arts flourished. Nico, I, so I visited Bruges before um, and I always kind of think of Bruges as just being this very charming and quaint small city. I don't think of it as being this economic powerhouse that has had this large influence on European history. Uh, can you give us a sense of what Bruges was like in the 14th and 15th centuries and the impact that it had? Um, sure. I mean, I, I when I take uh, tour members to Bruges before we arrive, I always tell them to imagine uh, being uh, rich, first of all, <laughs> and uh, visiting Bruges from, from somewhere else. They could be noble, nobility, or they could be merchants from different parts of Europe, and they would go shopping in the Beverly Hills of uh, the Middle Ages. <laughs> That's sometimes how I how I uh, mention it, because it was a city that uh, had almost everything. Uh, the location of Bruges was excellent. Um, 
merchants from the south, from Spain, from Italian city say, states, from France, they moved to Bruges and showed what they had. Uh, Bruges belonged to the Hanseatic League, so a lot of products from the north would be would be brought to Bruges. It, it had connections with England. It it uh, belonged to France, but it had a kind of semi-independent status. And all these merchants met, and they were exchanging goods. But it's also a place where you could could buy the the most uh, the the best perfected finished products from from uh, the best linen with the the most exquisite embroidery to the tapestries to the silk to to anything that was expensive you could find in Bruges also diamonds and jewelry so it was kind of a trading city in a port that was very well located and um with a different status than maybe other cities which attracted uh, a lot of people to come visit already at those times and maybe not as tourists but at least they they came from other places to come to Bruges well I love the description of the Beverly Hills of the medieval age um and the next time I need a, a new tiara or a, a nice fitted suit of armor um I know where to go <laughs> yes. well, let's continue on but in the 16th century its harbor silted up Trade moved to the port of Antwerp and the economy collapsed, ending Bruges' golden age. The town slumbered for generations. Then, in the 20th century, tourists discovered the charms of Bruges. Today, this uniquely well-preserved Gothic city prospers because of tourism. Even with its crowds, it's the kind of city where you don't mind being a tourist. And it hides some sweet surprises. The people of Bruges are connoisseurs of fine chocolate you'll be tempted by chocolate-filled display windows all over town. Locals buy their chocolates fresh daily, like other people buy pastries. They love the family-run places, like Dumont, where Madame Dumont and her children are hard at work. Their ganache, a dark, creamy combo, wows chocoholics. Bruges seems to have a chocolate shop on every corner, and some are more adventurous than others. The Chocolate Line, famous for its many gastronomic varieties, proudly shows off its kitchen. Everything here is lovingly made by hand. Nico, so correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that cocoa pods grow in Belgium. Um, how did Belgium become kind of synonymous with great chocolate? Well, uh, chocolate is, of course, not part of our Belgian. Uh, you won't see cocoa trees anywhere <laughs> in Belgium. Um, but uh, the area of, of, of Bruges specifically was was uh, uh, ruled by many different nations. And one of them was, was Spain at one point in time. We were the Spanish Netherlands. Hmm. So there was via the New World into Spain, but also later at the court of the Habsburgs and the French, uh, cocoa was was more of a drink which was already known at the courts so also in belgium we we um knew about it however what when we think of belgium chocolates it's the filled chocolates um the box with the little chocolates and then a different filling in it and that's more something from the late 19th century um actually the mid 19th century they started making making chocolate sweeter and so maybe uh, more popular for uh, masses and then in around 1912, just before the First World War, they they um, came up. A company in Brussels came up with with uh, making a chocolate candy and then a filling inside uh, with hazelnut uh, chocolate, and that was called the praline. Oh. So uh, later on, they they sold these little candy um, chocolate candies in a box per eight per sixteen. And um, several other companies followed suit. And uh, I think the reason why Belgian chocolate is so popular is because uh, maybe the competition between these chocolate makers and coming up with new flavors. And um, so we, we do import our chocolate from somewhere else. The cocoa beans come via the port of Antwerp. And then some bigger uh, chocolate makers make it into big chunks and small pieces of chocolate to send to the chocolate makers who make their own products. 
Well, it is, it's fascinating to see how that the flow of goods shaped Europe and it, it makes sense with uh, Bruges being um, such an important port. So thank you for that explanation, Nico. And now we're going to move some from some great tastes to some great music. The Market Square, ringed by restaurant terraces, great old gabled buildings, and the bell tower marks the city center today as it did in its medieval heyday. Back then, a canal came right to this main square. Farmers in the countryside would ship their wool and flax into Bruges. Before loading it onto outgoing boats, industrious locals would maximize their profit by dyeing, spinning, and weaving it into finished textiles. The bell tower has stood over Market Square since 1300. Climb the 366 steps for a commanding view. The tower houses a grand carillon. Rather than fingers, the carillon player uses his fists and feet. Nico, I know that Rick, um, when he's talking about Italy, he talks about this idea of campinalismo, which is um, the love for the sound of one's hometown bell tower. Um, do you feel like Belgians have kind of that campinalismo? Are these bell towers common in other cities in Belgium? And do, do people um, have a fondness for them? <laughs> um, it's, an, it's an interesting question. I think in general, um, uh, in general, people in Belgium maybe are not so proud about certain iconic buildings as, say, the Parisians are about the Notre Dame or, or uh, the, like you say, the Italians about the bell towers. Um, but, um, well, it's something that we're used to hearing. And we have a lot of belfry towers. If, if your city has a belfry tower, it meant it was important. And several belfry towers still have someone like this guy in the video who uh, plays the, the Carillon. And you can be surprised. Um, I was recently doing errands with my mom at my uh, at her place. Um, and I you saw people stop because they heard a song, a tune that they kind of recognized but didn't really know what it was. And you saw everybody puzzled. And uh, the Carillon player played a Lady Gaga song, uh, <laughs> that romance. And um, so it is at that moment, people will look up and say, oh, there's someone actually playing the, the, the Belfry Tower. But in other places, of course, you have a more automated um, uh, uh, bell. Uh, there's, there's also stories of a little town where, they, where the citizens were fed up with the Corinthian player because he played too long and too loud. Uh -huh. And they signed a petition for him to stop. But in general, it's part, I mean, the Belfry Tower is, is always a nice, it's a, a symbol of the civic pride. So it's not a church tower. So uh, I think, you know, it's, it's quite nice to have a Belfry Tower. And there's quite a lot of them all over the low countries. Nico, it's so funny that you say that because when I was visiting my cousins in the Netherlands, they showed me to their church and they were really proud to show it off and they had an organ and they asked if I played the piano. And I said, yes, because I, I had learned how, but they said, oh, you have to play a song. And the only song that I had memorized was Lady Gaga's Bad Romance. Oh. <laughs> and so I was, I just played it as slowly as I could so that they couldn't tell what the song was. Um, but <laughs> that's very funny that um, apparently I'm not the only one in the low countries <laughs> yes. playing yeah. Bad Romance on an old instrument. Yeah. All right, <laughs> let's continue on. The opulent square called Berg, Bruges' historical birthplace, political center, and religious heart is decorated with six centuries of fine architecture. The square's historic highlight is the Basilica of the Holy Blood. The gleaming gold knights and ladies on the church's facade remind us that this church was built by a crusader in the 12th century to house the drops of Christ's blood which he brought back from Jerusalem. Inside the basilica, the stark decor reeks of the medieval piety that drove those crusading European Christians on their holy war against the Muslims. 
With heavy columns and round arches, the style is pure Romanesque. Stairs lead to the brighter Gothic style upper chapel. The painting at the altar tells how the holy blood actually got here. Derek of Alsace helped conquer Muslim-held Jerusalem in the Second Crusade. Here, he kneels before the grateful Christian patriarch of Jerusalem, who rewards him with the relic. Derek returns home and kneels before Bruges Bishop to give him the vial of blood. Oh, that's a beautiful building and, and beautiful art, Nico. Um, and I'm curious, is today is um, Flanders and, and Belgium as the whole, is it more of a Catholic nation or more of a Protestant nation? So Belgium uh, would be considered a Catholic country. Mm -hmm. um, when we were the low countries, where we were kind of a loose unity with the, with the North, with what is now the Netherlands, uh, th there was more religious uh, tolerance, especially in the 16th, 17th century. You have had quite a lot of uh, non-Catholic movements. But then we were ruled by the Spanish, and that was the start of the 80 Years' War. And the Spanish were very clear they did not want non-Catholics. So that's kind of where the split between the Netherlands and Belgium, as they are right now, happened. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of Protestants, uh, but also Jewish people or Freemasons, uh, all the Huguenots that you may have heard about, they all moved north to escape the Spanish uh, Inquisition. Mm -hmm. And so since then, since the 17th century, Belgium has always been... Um, much more Catholic. I mean, there's hardly any Protestant churches. I mean, there are, but they're very small, like maybe 2% of society is Protestant. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, that's fascinating, the divide between Belgium and the Netherlands, even though they're so similar in so many other ways. Um, all right, let's finish up our tour of Bruges. Next door is the town hall. 15th century Bruges was a thriving bastion of capitalism, and this building served as a model for town halls elsewhere, including Brussels. One of Europe's first representative governments convened right here. In the adjoining room, old paintings and maps show how little the city has changed over the centuries. This map shows in exquisite detail the city as it looked in 1562, when a canal connected the North Sea to the Market Square. A fortified moat circles the city. Of the town's 28 windmills, four survive today. The mills made paper, ground grain, and functioned as the motor of the Middle Ages. All right, um, so we got a taste of some Belgian chocolates in that last video, and now we are going to taste another Belgian treat. Working up an appetite, you'll be tempted by the smell of French fries. Called Flemish fries here, they're a local specialty. And in Belgium, fries are an art form taken very seriously. Who made the first fry? Belgium. This potato was peeled this morning, cut in pieces, and put in that fat. So you, you, you actually cook it in the grease two times? Two times. Once in that, then it rests here. Afterwards, second time, high temperature. Low temperature, resting, cooling, high temperature. These are forming a skin right now? Yes. You see, these fries are swimming like fishes in the fat. <laughs> see? Yeah, I, I, you hear it? They are talking. You hear I hear sound? it, yes. What are they saying? Oh, that they are ready to be eaten. <laughs> oh. What do you need more? Taste one, please. <laughs> Is it hot? Top of the fingers, because it's hot, yes. Mm. Only a little bit salt on it, and it's perfect. Uh, Nico, I mean, society has some amazing foods, but I don't know if anything is ever going to beat just potatoes fried in grease. Um, <laughs> it's so good. Um, 
I'm wondering though, Nico, I know that you have some foods to share with us and I was hoping that you could share with us some foods that you have with you tonight and um, other foods that Flanders is known for. Um, well, a lot of the food that we're known for, I cannot just present to you because it's something <laughs> that you eat in the restaurants. And I would, after this video, I would have wanted to, walk. I actually live very close to a, a place that sells fries, anything with it, but it's closed. Um, but if you come to Belgium, maybe we don't have the big sites that, that people expect from other countries, but um, we have great food. I always say it's, it's a French food in German proportions. <laughs> so you get uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, meals. Uh, the, our, the most typical would be Flemish stew. It's either beef or pork stew. And uh, the nice thing with the stew is that it's prepared with beer. Uh, so we have a lot of dishes that are prepared with uh, a Belgian beer. Um, Waterzooi is something from Ghent. It's like a thick soup with, with chunks of uh, vegetables and, and chicken in Ghent, but not uh, fish at the coast. Uh, we have rabbits. Uh, it's something that I always like recommending people to try in, in Bruges is to try the rabbit. Um, and uh, something which is iconic for Belgium, even though we don't grow them, we get them from the Netherlands, is the mussels. Mm. Um, the mussels with fries. Um, and if you're at the coast, I think any restaurant at the coast will have a, a North Sea shrimp croquettes as an appetizer, which is an absolute must. Um, so it's a it's a very nice, yeah. You could you could just eat your way through Belgium, um, and the Netherlands as well. But uh, we have quite a lot of food, and like I said, a lot is with beer. Um, I just checked what I had in the in the in the 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 uh, at home here. I have all kinds of beers. Maybe this is the the beer from uh, the brewery in Bruges. It's okay. called um, the Brugse Zot which means the Corchester or the Fool of Bruges. It was a nickname that was given to the people of Bruges. And it's a, a very light lager beer, this one, but they have uh, stronger beers in um, in the brewery. Their stronger beer is called Strong Henry, if you okay. translate it after the founder of the brewery. And so if you go to Bruges, I would definitely recommend to go to that brewery. Um, my favorite a little bit is, uh, is Duvel. Duvel? Which is uh, 8.8 .8 and a half point uh, percent. So it's quite heavy. So if you come to uh, Belgium and you want to try the beers, you may want to uh, be aware that they're uh, heavy on alcohol. Mm -hmm. And so you you taste them. You you uh, don't drink. You don't binge drink Belgian beers. You just uh, enjoy them. I'm going to open one if that's okay. Oh, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we still have a, a few minutes. But um, it comes in different glasses. So all Belgian beers come with specific glasses. This is the Duvel glass. Oh, wow. It's literally for that brand. It's for that. So you can uh, you can basically only drink Duvel in this glass. <laughs> you know, if it would be uh, sacrilegious if you drink it from a different uh, glass. And um, yeah, we have a lot of specialty beers. We have a lot of Abbey beers brewed by abbots and, we, and, and Trappist monks. But some people who say, oh, we, you know, I don't like beer. In Belgium, you have so many different flavors, depending on the yeast or on the uh, aromas that are added. And one of the most uh, popular one is the cherry beer. Oh. And uh, yeah, it's very fruity. It's very sweet. Um, in general, uh, female travelers who say we don't like beer are sometimes surprised with our fruit beers. You also have raspberry beer peach beer um and uh, i just discovered a, a new one lupulus uh, which has a, a it's it's from the south of belgium uh, so that's a nice thing when you 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 travel within your country and you go to a place that has a beer that you've never tried you like maybe the name of it and then you try it and then you look for it if you like it and uh, i found it in the supermarket and so with beer maybe you want to eat some cheese we have, uh, we're, it's, we're not the Netherlands, we're not France, but almost every abbey or every place that has beer produces cheese as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, some other uh, areas with dairy farms have their typical uh, cheeses. And um, uh, Passendal is a very famous uh, cheese. 
uh, makery. If you take a, a flight with Brussels Airlines, the cheese on the on the plane will be Passendale cheese. I'm not sure if I'll start with the cheese, but uh, it's difficult to combine with chocolates. <laughs> At home, even if you don't have a box of chocolates, you'll always have bars of chocolate. This company is, uh, I think, about 125 years old or maybe older and makes very good chocolate uh, bars. Um, and then something maybe typical, I don't know if you know the Biscoff cookie. Mm -hmm. Yes. This is I feel the like Biscoff I have those cookie. on airplanes too. Yes. So you can buy them just as cookies. Uh huh. But um, it's something very typical, and I think it's available in the North America as well, is a spreading of those cookies, uh, just like you have peanut butter or chocolate paste. Uh huh. You uh, basically um, have a spreading with the taste of Biscoff. <laughs> so, so it's uh, cookie butter. It's cookie butter. Yeah, that's basically it's not it's not peanut butter. It's not chocolate paste, but it's cookie <laughs> butter, and. Um, it's something that you definitely should try, and most hotels will have it as a, a for breakfast. Um, but there's many more. I mean, you can do we can do a whole show about Belgian food. I, you know? uh, so if if bread and butter is not carby enough for you, just add cookies into the mix. Yes. Um, well, thank you for sharing that with <laughs> us, Nico. I really wish that I had a cherry beer and some cheese, but all I could muster was I do have my little. Ah, yes, you do. Yeah. So, um, did you get it from an airplane or did you get it from a store or I think that one of my roommates was just on a flight and got them they were just sitting around at my house they just magically appeared a couple days ago in anticipation of this show maybe a little Belgian elf dropped them off I don't know so um, you take a, a piece of bread you <laughs> smear butter on it and then you press the cookies on it up. yeah <laughs> All right. Well, now that we um, have gotten our snack, um, Nico, we are going to continue our journey. Um, we're going to finish up with just a few final thoughts on Bruges before we explore uh, to the rest of West Flanders. But first, you are going to share with us um, some of your other favorite things to do in Bruges. Here we go. Hmm. So what are we looking yeah. at here, Nico? Well, this is this is like the spot in Bruges where everybody takes a picture. And during the day, it can be super crowded. But I would always recommend people to stay overnight in Bruges. It's a day trip destination. And often people visit it in a rush. Um, but if you're overnight, you, you, can, uh, you can just walk around. A lot of places are illuminated. When you go on a day trip, you see like the, the part between the train station and the market square, which is a third of the city and is, is super crowded. But uh, I would say venture out of it. There's like two thirds of, of medieval Bruges that you can discover without the crowds. And maybe it doesn't have the museums, but there's all kinds of churches that in other cities would be like the, the number one visited site. But because they're in competition with different parts in Bruges, they get neglected. Mm -hmm. So the St. Salvator Church, for instance, is the church that I would recommend everybody. Yeah. The next picture is a group I had uh, uh, earlier on. Maybe some of them are watching right now. <laughs> but um, this is the bridge that you saw Rick walk over all alone, which is very rare because there's always a traffic jam of tourists on this bridge. It's like part of the walking tour and... It's just jammed with, with, so it's very unique that we have a group picture on the bridge. And next to it, to the right uh, of the bridge is a oh. museum that I, oh, well, it's okay. It's in the museum district. And I would <laughs> definitely recommend the two museums in that area. But you can go to the other slide. Yes, we have horse-drawn carriages on the market square. And then I think Rick mentions it in the video. You have 366 uh, stairs to go to the top view of the Belfry Tower. The only, a beautiful, I mean, in good weather, it's beautiful. Uh, to the left, we have the Church of Our Lady. And to the right is another of these churches that nobody visits, 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 but it's the Magdalena Church. And the interesting thing is they have a swing inside of the church. That's me sitting on a swing. Hmm. And I recommend this to everybody. And I guess if I mention it now, 
in this show, maybe the church will, <laughs> will, <laughs> will, maybe it's not going to be there forever, but it's a church that has a very unique way of, of uh, attracting people to the church by putting different art in it. But they also have this swing inside of a church. So that's quite unique. That's the big beer wall of the BE store. It's a building that has only Belgian products, but I always recommend people to go in just to see how these buildings looked like in the Middle Ages. And they have a wall with almost 800 beers and each beer is presented with its uh, different glass. Um, so it's it's fun to just uh, go look for, for the different shapes of uh, beers. Oh, this is the Holy Blood procession, which uh, uh, happens on Ascension Day, which was a few days ago. Uh, these are pictures from a previous edition. So basically, it's a parade where they show, um, just like um, Rick mentioned, how, how the relic came from the Holy Land to, to Bruges. And so you have all kinds of um, uh, groups of people interpreting not only the life of Jesus Christ and Bible scenes, but also how this relic came from the uh, Holy Land to Bruges. And it's fun for, for everybody, for every tourist, but also for kids, because they, uh, will, they'll see the dromedaries and they'll see the sheep. And, and it's also with live animals walking through the streets of Bruges. And you can uh, reserve or make a reservation for a seat. Most people watch it while, while it's uh, along the street. But you can mm -hmm. also have VIP seats to see it up close. Well, and Nico, I loved what you said um, earlier about staying the night in Bruges. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, Robin and I were talking about how sometimes in these very in these cities that are very popular with tourists, um, you know, there are parts of the city that do get overcrowded. But there are two ways to avoid that. One, like you said, you can go to other parts of the city that are still beautiful, but don't maybe have those few major sites, or you can make sure that you stay the night so that you can experience the city in the evening when it's nice and empty. So thank you for these additional looks at Bruges. And you also have a fun little day trip from Bruges that you wanted to tell us about. Well, a lot of times people come to Bruges and they want to rent a bike. And um, inside of Bruges, it's quite difficult if you haven't biked for a while. Um, we don't recommend it because the city is full of cobblestones and tourists and horses. And it's just, uh, it's a mess sometimes. Uh, but an easy day trip on a bike is along a canal that was dug to the town of Damme. Uh, and uh, it, it's very easy. It's relatively flat. It's lined with trees. You cannot really miss the direction because it's a straight direction it's not a medieval grip of, of a grid of small streets the only thing that you have to be aware of is uh, sometimes people drive uh, or bike to to dom and say oh that was easy but they had a tailwind hmm. and then uh, in dom itself uh, there's not so much to see but it's a beautiful charming village and they have a beer or they have lunch and then they drive this is the city hall on the right hand side and there's a church ruin on the left-hand side. And it's it, it has quite a lot of tea rooms and restaurants. And it's a book village with a lot of bookstores. But uh, when people drive back to Bruges, then they realize that the, they have the wind against them. And so it mm -hmm. takes a bit longer. And that's when they can get on the boat, the paddle boat that we saw in the previous picture, back mm -hmm. to Bruges. Well, I think it sounds like a, a lovely bike ride, a lovely way to stretch your legs. And I've never heard of the term a book village before, but as somebody who goes into pretty much every bookstore that I can, yeah. I feel like I need to make a pilgrimage to Dama now. Yeah, so there's like these um, every second Sunday, I think it's a way of attracting um, tourists. And mm -hmm. so you would have a book fair and the old elementary school can turn into a, like a, a secondhand book fair. In, in the summer months, or it has a poetry festival. You have a few of these villages, uh, not only in Belgium, but uh, they need to find a way of uh, attracting tourists. And it could be arts, it could be uh, music, it could be uh, literature. Well, thank you for this peek at Dama. And speaking of tourists, my guess is that there are a lot of vacationers that want to go to De Kust. Um, Nico, what is the Kust? 
the kust is basically the the, the Dutch word for uh, the coast. Uh, so the kust is uh, our our coastline is very small compared to other countries. It's I think forty miles between the French border and the Dutch border. And um, if the weather is it, nobody nobody books uh, a holiday to Belgium for a coastal holiday because we don't know with the weather what it's going to be like. But if you're in Belgium and the weather is fine, then there's a lot of day trippers who go to the coast just to have the North Sea breeze. And uh, you can do all kinds of activities at the coast that maybe are not so typical for North America. We saw a girl making on the previous uh, slide, a girl making uh, flowers out of paper and uh, she sells it for uh, uh, to, to other children who collect shells. And so it's like a trade going on <laughs> between shells and flowers. And then in the other slide that you showed, you have uh, on the left, bottom left, you have go-karts, which is so typical for the Belgian coast. You, you, this is now for just two people, but you can have the whole family sit on one for like with 16 people. You, you basically ride along the coast and you have um, uh, Ostend is the big city. It's the royal city of the coast where the royals had their um, stay in the building on the on the top left. And then along the coast, you have traditional shrimp collectors. They're on these uh, Belgian horses that drag nets uh, through the um, wading sea and um, get the shrimp for the shrimp croquettes that I just uh, mentioned and the appetizer. It's a more of a folkloric thing. And there's a lot of art all over uh, the coastline. So you have mural art in Ostende. And then um, very contemporary art, which uh, uh, like the cans, they look like garbage cans, but they're more than life size. Um, and I personally like them. A lot of people don't like them, but they're still there. And um, it's it's uh, often fun to just uh, do the coastline. There's a whole uh, a coastal streetcar that goes along the whole uh, 40 miles. And so you can get on and get off uh from and then walk to these I, I like specifically the one to the right which is a like a construction crane um vehicle but it's built in a gothic style uh like you have the gothic uh, cathedrals and buildings in the rest of the country and um so you of course the weather is important but we have great food at our coast again the mussels and the shrimp and then there's a lot of art uh, wherever you go. You also can go to uh, Raversede, which is a, a part of the Atlantic Wall that uh, was built during the Second World War, because the Germans thought that uh, the Allied forces would inv or would basically liberate or come towards the Belgian coast, but in the end they went to Normandy. And so um, a lot of the, in the rest of Europe, a lot of this Atlantic wall has disappeared, but this is a very well-preserved part of how the Germans, well, the Nazis, more uh, specific, um, wanted to protect the coastline. So uh, it's a worth a day trip for those who are interested in, in World War II history. Yeah, the Han is my favorite town. <laughs> It's the only town that doesn't have the high-rise apartment buildings on the coast, and it uh, has a very Belle Epoque feel, which means it's from the, the turn of last century and then after the uh, First World War, uh, beautiful villas. That's the little streetcar stop that you see on the right-hand side, uh, one of the first uh, fancy hotels to the left. Um, this is where Einstein lived in the 1930s, in 1933. Uh -huh. Is and that most... him on the bench there, Nico? Uh, yes, yes, actually, yes, yes, it's him on the <laughs> bench. I, I was more looking at the at the house here on the screen, but you do see Albert uh, Einstein sitting on the bench. You can go sit next to him, and um, I mean, you can do a whole trail of why he ended up in um, the Han. Uh, he came over from the states to Antwerp, and then in 1933, people already told him not to go to Germany anymore. And uh, he decided to stay in, in Belgium before uh, getting back to the U.S. And mm. someone suggested, why don't you go live at the coast? And it's a beautiful, charming little village. Well, no, sorry, it's a town. I shouldn't say it's a village. 
but it has this village appeal it doesn't have the main shopping streets like other big cities and it still has the dunes you can still walk in the dunes and still see that there's nature because we're a build-up country but um it's a very nice little town called the Ham, which means the rooster Nico, thank you for that lovely jaunt along the Belgian coast. Um, and now that we've had our, our fun in the sun, we are going to turn to something a little bit more sobering, uh, but very important, which is uh, the Flanders Fields. Um, what are the Flanders Fields? Well, the Flanders Fields is basically a part that uh, also goes into France. And the, there's a border between Belgium and France, but the Flanders Fields was the battlegrounds of the First World War. And um, especially the the area around Ypres, which uh, you saw on the next slide. This is uh, how the English and the French named the city Ypres, but it's uh, in uh, Dutch called Ypres. And so it's that's the center of the, the big battles that happened in the First World War. So this town of Ypres used to be a medieval city. If you look through the gate all the way at the end, you see the Belfry Tower and the Cloth Hall which you also see if you go back to one slide quickly, if possible. On the right-hand side, that's uh, where the, the cloth hall is, where they have the Flanders Fields Museum, which talks about the First World War. And the gate that you see has a fifth, more than 50,000 names of, of soldiers missing in action. So this city was ravaged. And I think we can see that in the next slide. With uh, This was the church of Ypres, which was totally destroyed. I mean, the city was flattened. And uh, it was re-erected. I like how the pigeons are uh, looking at the uh, <laughs> on the page. But this is taken from the Belfry Tower, um, how the church was re-renovated uh, and redone after the First World War. And now it's a very charming city as well. Uh, but it is the 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 center, the central city for anybody who wants to learn or visit the Flanders Fields area. This is a nice statue just outside of the ramparts of Ypres. And uh, maybe people have, to, uh, the viewers have to look a little bit into it on to see what it actually is, represents. But you may see soldiers giving, or a girl giving a flower to a soldier and a little boy giving a flower to another soldier on both sides. I don't know if you can spot it. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. It almost feels it's, like a Rorschach ink blots, but now yes. I can see it. Yeah, it's like one of those psychology tests, you know, where you, they, they want you to uh, see what <laughs> what it is. And also very nice on this uh, monument is something else that Iper is known for. If you look in the bottom, you can also see two cats at the feet of the little uh, of the children, because uh, Iper is known as the cat city. Um, here you have it, the Cotton Stut, the, the the cat parade. It happens every so often, not every year. And it's basically a tradition. Uh, the cloth hall that I mentioned before had a lot of uh, linen and a lot of mice and rats. And so they had a lot of cats who needed to get rid of the rats and the mice. But these cats got a lot of kittens. And so they uh, had to get rid of the kittens. And they did it in the medieval times by throwing them off the Belfry Tower. Oh, no. Uh, yes. Oh. And they still do that, Gabe. They still do it. Uh, but not with real life kittens, but with uh, oh, okay. stuffed, uh, yeah. <laughs> stuffed uh, kittens. And so you have a parade about cats and every school group is dressed like a cat a mythology legend. And uh, every cat that is thrown from the Belfry Tower has a voucher for maybe a dinner in a restaurant, a local restaurant, or, or to exchange for a gift in a certain store. And so it attracts a lot of people. And so some legends also say that they, they threw cats from the Belfry Tower because they thought they were witches. And if they if if you know if the cat turned into a witch uh, when it fell down, then you know, yay, you know, they killed the witch. But most of the time, of course, it was just the cat who died. But well, uh, I, that's, I that's that medieval that horror. Yeah. I think that today's tradition sounds a little bit more fun to get restaurant vouchers than to just get hit in the head with a flailing kitten. Um, yes. So I, I'm glad that it's taken a, a turn for what it is today. <laughs> so you see cats everywhere. But there is, of course, references to the uh, First World War. On the right hand side are three buglers who play the last post every day at eight o'clock. 
underneath of that gate that we saw earlier on. And it's a, it's a very moving ceremony, um, which if you stay overnight or if you stay longer in the city is worth uh, staying later for because it's a ceremony every day at eight o'clock. And then to the left is um, one of the many monuments on roundabouts in the area that, that make you think, I mean, you, you, it's a beautiful area, but you are constantly reminded of the fact that, that uh, death was everywhere. And the irony in, the, in this sculpture says, uh, the word says leaven, which means life, but it's clearly not a lively uh, monument. And, and so they, they, these are monuments on roundabouts when you do trips, because it's difficult to get to the Flanders Fields battlegrounds um, on your own. You can bike a lot in the area, or you can rent a local guide, or you can rent a car and drive. There's a lot of you can spend a lot of days in the city of Ypres and around it. Just uh, not only World War One, but uh, it's everywhere. So it's part of of the visit, of course. Popering is another town in the area that is known for its hop fields. And um, the picture on the right represents the officer's um, building, or it's a house where officers stayed uh, during the First World War, away from the front line. And it's now an interesting museum. And the fun thing is that in this museum, they rent out the officers' uh, rooms as uh, hotel rooms. So you can stay overnight inside of a museum and then hopefully uh, be awake and, and dressed when the first visitors of the museum come around. But uh, it's, it's a fun thing. There's, you can also go on a lot of hikes in the area. On the left is how the, the, the forests looked like now with the wildflowers. And you have, uh, uh, well, we're flatland, but you have trails that take you to uh, through marshland. And then this is on the right, a... Uh, tower for ornithologists who watch uh, migrating birds come by um, or just the, the wading birds in the marshland. You can only do the trail when it hasn't rained. And then a little bit further, oh yeah, I see this Wareham, a little bit further uh, away from the Flanders Fields area is uh, Wareham, which is very important for Americans because it's the uh, American First World War um, World uh, Cemetery. It's very small. This is one. Of, this is my first group of the year, I think, on the left. So there's the chapel. And then on the right-hand side, this was um, a preparation for Memorial Day uh, last year, where local school kids also help raise the flag. And so there's still a lot of um, interaction between local schools and the American War Cemetery. And it's an interesting stop, if, especially if you're from uh, the U.S. For the Canadian viewers, Passchendaele is uh, much more important. But um, yeah, a lot of a lot of things to talk about. You know, when I see all these slides. <laughs> well, Nico, speaking of Passchendaele, you very kindly went out on your own. You found time between all of your spring touring, and you filmed some Monday night travel video exclusives. Um, including some videos at the Pashandala Gardens. So um, we are going to take a peek at those now and get a closer look at some of this World War I history. There's more to Flanders Fields um, than Ypres, which is the big city of uh, Flanders Fields area and World War I tourism. We also have the little town of uh, Zonnebeke, which has a village called Passendale in Dutch, but for especially Canadians known as Passchendaele. And on the communal side of Zonnebeke, they have this museum, which is the uh, Passchendaele World War Memorial Museum. And it's not only a great museum where you learn how it was to be a soldier in the First World War, the Great War, as they called it. Uh, you also uh, see a little bit how life was in the trenches. But I personally come uh, here for the garden. They have an uh, incredible memorial garden and I want to uh, walk through it because uh, this time of the year, of course, we may still see more flowers than usual. 
In 2013, the uh, city here, Zona Baker, decided to uh, annex two castle grounds by creating a memorial park, um, which uh, they designed with different uh, small gardens of uh, allied forces in the shape of a poppy. And in every single poppy-shaped garden, you have indigenous plants of the countries that fought in the First World War. Nico, um, can you remind me what what is the significance of the poppy flower um, in World War I? Well, the poppies, um, uh, they're not really that uh, ab abundant here in the area. Uh, people know it and it's linked to Flanders fields and it's the symbol of remembrance. And be, uh, often tourists come and they say, where are the poppies? And you don't see them. But apparently in 1915, uh, the soil after years of battling was, was uh, apparently rich enough to have an overabundance of poppies. And so a lot of uh, soldiers who wrote letters home mentioned it, not only in, in, in our area, but also, for instance, Gallipoli in Turkey, Maybe you know the movie with Mel Gibson, but also uh, a lot of people fought in the First World War in Turkey. And so poppies popped up there as well. And uh, it was basically uh, became a, an immortal image because of a poem by John McRae, a Canadian uh, doctor who wrote in Flanders fields where poppy grows, where poppies grow. It's basically a, 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 a standard poem about the First World War. And mm -hmm. so this park um gave uh yeah um, it shaped it with different poppies um mm -hmm. and then every poppy represents a country that was fighting in the war ah that is that's and it's fascinating that it um you know just happened more during that specific period of time um all right let's continue touring the garden this is the uh, canadian section and you do have some uh, visitors, but it's never really, really crowded. And I'm going to walk to the American poppy garden as well, which is over there. Um, so it's a communal park, but now called the Memorial Park of uh, Passchendaele. Uh, every country, like for instance, the Belgian garden or the French garden or the British garden. There's also the Australian a New Zealand garden as well, I believe. But um, maybe our viewers want to see the uh, American poppy garden, which has a, a map of the US with a quote from uh, Woodrow Wilson, which is maybe interesting to show. And you may see that we're not mowing uh, the grass this month. Uh, it's to give uh, nature some time to breathe. So this is the uh, American Poppy Garden, and I'll end with a, a quote by President Woodrow Wilson. Belgium, the whole world will agree, must be evacuated and restored without any attempt to limit the sovereignty which she enjoys in common with all other free nations. This is the, the French uh, garden in the park and I really like the um, fact that next to a museum with a lot of heavy information inside, there's a garden where you can go and go for a walk. It's a very nice, pleasant walk in the garden um, and reflect on what you just learned about in the museum inside. I'm at the New Zealand garden and I want to show you something that I think is uh, quite striking. It's uh, just like a concrete pillar that you see, but uh, it has all kinds of little holes in it. And every hole represents the 846 soldiers from New Zealand who died in a battle here. And it gives you kind of like a daunting moment when you step into the column. Nico, you used the word um, striking for that. And I would, I think that striking, that's just a per perfect adjective. Um, 
And I guess I was surprised to learn that New Zealand and Australia had armies in World War I. I'm sure that's maybe common knowledge for World War I buffs, but um, I do not count myself among those ranks. Um, can you explain why New Zealand and Australia got involved? Well, this is this is 1914, 1918. And so countries like uh, Australia, New Zealand, still were basically uh, uh, Britain, but overseas. Uh, mm -hmm. Together also with ca Canada, uh, they belong to the what is now known as the Commonwealth. Uh, so there was a strong link with the motherland, England, or Scotland, or Ireland, or Wales. And so when England was at war, when Britain was at war, there was this uh, need to go help. And so uh, from Australia and New Zealand, but also from Canada, uh, several people came over to fight a war that really wasn't theirs, mm. but it was more, um, you know, there were, it was campaigning, especially the, uh, in Australia, uh, you, you may have heard the term ANZAC, it's mm. Australia, New Zealand, um, army, uh, yeah. Army Corps. Yeah. Um, and so basically... What happened is that that the, the, I think from from uh, Australia and New Zealand about three hundred thirty thousand uh, soldiers came uh, over to Europe, not only in 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 France and in Belgium but also in Turkey. Hmm. And so, at the beginning, it was voluntarily. Why did people come out of uh, maybe just the link with the motherlands? But it was, it's interesting to know that actually after the First World War, the countries like Australia, New Zealand, they, they kind of um, started uh, maybe uh, cutting loose from mm -hmm. uh, the motherland after realizing why would we have to go fight uh, someone else's battle. Um, but at the time, it was very much part of the British Empire still. So um, I'm using brackets because I don't know the terminology at the time uh, when, yeah. when Australia and, and New Zealand or Canada, I mean, they all still have the head of state of England, so they still are connected. Um, but that's why they were there. And the park actually has a very nice sculpted wooden um, sculpture from Maoris who uh, gave it for the centennial celebration. So there's a beautiful sculpted uh, uh, Maori um, symbol uh, there wow. as well. All right. Well, let's keep exploring. I cannot film inside of the museum, which is uh, excellent, by the way, but I can uh, walk in the trenches and film here outdoors as well. They're recreated, but they are on the location of real trenches. And you can see a little bit the, the loopholes, the... Um, way uh, the Germans specifically were able to defend the area. Um, inside of the museum you learn about the different sides of the World War I history but also focus on for instance the role of women during the war. Um, it's a lot of material. They also have the dugout experience which is uh, underneath of uh, the museum and uh, learns about how they were treating the sick. This is, for instance, uh, how it looked when they found it, and this is how it's been uh, redone, reinforced. And after walking through the trenches, which are replicas of part British and part um, German trenches, you can have a visit to this little tiny house, which uh, looks like an American house, and it is. It's something that um, is not often uh, mentioned, but after the war, uh, the Americans built temporary houses for the locals who wanted to return to uh, the area that was uh, devastated and destroyed. And inside is now a museum that talks a bit more about the American part of the First World War. Um, and it also shows, for instance, that there is a remembrance trail of the First World War that kind of starts in France and all the way ends up here, you know, where we are right now. Well, 
Nico, thank you again for that recent look at the Passchendaele Gardens. And we're now going to take a look at one more Flanders Field site um, that I believe you filmed this earlier in the pandemic. So let's take a look. Their name lived forevermore. I'm at the uh, Tyne Cot Cemetery. I was supposed to be here with a group of 28 tourists. It would have been crowded. It's the time of the year when you have a lot of tourists come here, but also a lot of school kids, especially from Britain. Now there's nobody. This is the Commonwealth Cemetery in Passendale, Passchendaele. 12,000 casualties are buried here. The Cross of Sacrifice in the middle, built on a German bunker. This was the site of a big battle, the Battle of Passchendaele. So 12,000 casualties, but also the names of 35,000 missing in action on the memory wall that you see in the back. Striking is, compared to what I normally see here, that there's no little roses, little poppies that normally are placed by the many uh, school teenagers who come here from Britain to honor um, their great-grandparents who fought in the First World War. So, um, Nico, I'm, I'm curious, is it... It seems like the, at least in this part of the country, in this part of Flanders, uh, World War I is very much uh, front of mind. Is that something that a lot of students learn about during school? Um, do the schools in Belgium very intentionally try to keep educating students about this period of history? It's part of the curriculum. So any kid has to learn about it. It's uh, our for, for Belgium, I think the First World War, especially in this region, was, was more devastating than the Second World War. In other parts of Belgium, that's not the case. But here in West Flanders, because of the battlefields, uh, even if you don't go to school, I mean, the, the cemeteries are everywhere. You're, you're constantly confronted with it. So uh, over here in this part of Belgium, uh, uh, in elementary school, you already have uh much to 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 learn about it because it's there i mean it's easy when it's there you learn more about it um when we see a secondary schools we have them from france from the rest of belgium from the netherlands who come visit this um cemetery but they're not always i i noticed like now it was super quiet in the video this was shot in 2020 mm -hmm. and if you go now it's you already have the school groups and then of course half of the the teenagers have to be there because they have to, but they don't really, you know, they're taking selfies on the, on the cemetery mm -hmm. and so on, or just sit there on their smartphone being uninterested. But we do see uh, a lot of uh, British school groups who, um, I mean, they come on, on, a, on several day trips and they are much more prepared and they, they have to learn about their family, what did their family do in the, in the first world war? Um, so I think the British school groups are a bit more prepared when they visit, mm -hmm. and the um, uh, the elementary schools in the region are very well aware of it. And then, like anything, you know, teenagers from around, I mean, they have to go on a school trip, but they're more interested in buying the chocolates on the market mm -hmm. of the Iper than, uh, than maybe the cemeteries, which is sad, but it's a very, it's, it's um, part of, uh, our history, you know, it's a, it's a, a lot of things changed after the First World War. It was more of a Flemish identity after the First World War. So there's there are several things that are important, and that's why it's part of the the curriculum. All right. Well, Nico, we have one more stop on tonight's tour before we get to some questions for you, and that is your um the the major city in your home region um which is Kortrijk. so let's take a look at your videos there i know i never pronounce it quite right no it was great it was well it was, it was great <laughs> hello from a uh, 
Yeah, it's a, a little unknown town in Flanders, in West Flanders, along the Lys River. It has a medieval uh, history and we have a beautiful Gothic hall, a city hall. We have a belfry tower. It's not as big as the one in Bruges, but it's uh, quite important. There used to be a cloth hall here. It was a cloth trading city in the Middle Ages. Now the market square is very charming and has a lot of restaurants and eateries. And I'm going to take you into the most charming um, biginage that we have in the Low Countries. Some of you may know the biginage from uh, Bruges, others maybe from Amsterdam, but we have them all around the area and the one in Kortrijk is one of the best preserved. A Monday night travel exclusive, we're going to enter the most charming biginage of the Low Countries. Uh, in English you say beginage because it's uh, derived from French, but in the Dutch language we use the word Begeenhof. It was basically a little town within a bigger city. It was closed off by a big wall. And inside you would have the Begins, the Begeentjes, who lived together. Women who, took, who did not take the vows. So they were not nuns, but they lived together. They were quite religious. And you can see a little image of how they would live inside of this uh, sample house. Nico, I'm, I'm curious, why did these women not take the vows that nuns did? And kind of what was their daily life like? <laughs> well, um, well, the origin of this order, because it was kind of an order uh, spread around the Low Countries, France and parts of Germany, um, is from the 13th century. And so uh, there was an overabundance of women uh, because the men went uh, away on crusades or uh, for wars and they didn't return. And if you were a, women, a woman at the time, you could go to a convent, but there were very few convents and uh, some people don't realize it, but you had to pay to enter a convent. Mm. So you had to be part of a rich family. So if you were a poor woman and you, you didn't have the means to contribute to the convent, well, you could stay behind in the village and, and be poor, or you could go live in the woods and become uh, a witch. Or you could go to the city and become a prostitute, maybe. So there was an idea of uh, why not um, why not go live together? And in case men return, we can still um, we can still leave. And that, so they didn't take the vows. But they did a lot of religious work. They prayed a lot, of course, but they were also a bit the social workers of the time, helping the poor, helping the elderly. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, yeah, I think the reason why they didn't want to uh, take the vows is, well, they didn't have the money to become a nun. And also maybe because they still hoped of, of seeing a, a knight on in shining armor come by. And take them somewhere fancy. I don't know, <laughs> but that's that's, uh, that's like the core of of why why these women um, live together. Eh? They 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 were self sufficient uh, within their little town. So, well, I mean, yeah, that's quite the choice: nun or witch. Uh, I guess that this is a, a nice alternative. Um, all right, let's continue our tour of Court Break. So they look uh, appear quite religious. And you always had, of course, a church inside of the compound, but there was enough space also to grow their vegetables and to uh, maybe have animals as well. A lot of the uh, little houses are now still owned by the city of Kortrijk and rented out as social housing, but others have turned into little bars, cafes, like this one here, where you can get a really good coffee or hot chocolate since it's Belgium. And then you go into the little smaller streets of this uh, little enclosure within a big city. A lot of big cities in the Low Countries had something like this. Most of the beginages have been opened up in cities like Antwerp or Ghent or Brussels. You don't really see it as charming as it is right now. From the 17th century, 1622, uh, one of these houses here has turned into a bed and breakfast. And maybe you can already hear it. As soon as you go into a beginage, it becomes super quiet. 
And the Beguinage was close to the Church of Our Lady, which is one of the main sites of uh, Kortrijk. Beautiful art, but also historically very important. And I just wanted to uh, show you also a site in the Beguinage of the St. Martin's Church, which is the bigger church of Kortrijk. And look, there's hardly any tourists here. So if you want to take a picture of a Beguinage without tourists, you have to come to Kortrijk. There's also an uh, information center in that building about the history of the Beguines. We're uh, inside of the Church of Our Lady, Onze Lieve Vrouwenkerk, which um, of course we have a lot of in a Catholic Belgium. Uh, almost every <laughs> big city has a Church of Our Lady. But um, this one is quite unique in the sense that it has some historic meaning, but also because you have a painting by uh, Anthony van Dijk in the church. Now, this is a painting worth of hanging in any renowned museum in the world, but it's here, here just part of the church. And the historic uh, meaning of it is, uh, has now turned into some kind of museum. It's about the Battle of the Golden Spurs in 1302. So in the beginning of the 14th century, there was one big battle where Flemish uh, peasants and guild leaders fought the French army. And what they did is that they were able, with a peasant army, to take off the golden spurs of the French knights. And here in the church, I'm not sure if you can see it, but they're hanging from the ceiling these golden spurs. The 11th of July, 1302, is now a national holiday for the Flemish region. And you can learn more about it with these uh, interactive maps. They are also with the 3D images, so you can uh, see how the battle took place. And they also have now a new multimedia experience, which is really great but um, it uh, goes on every half hour or so in the castle or in the chapel of the Counts of Flanders which is over here which is a chapel that has all kinds of uh, Counts of Flanders from all the way to the beginning towards the end and then you have a multimedia experience going on definitely worth a visit so there you go, a quick uh, visit to two sides of Kortrijk, which has much more to offer. This is the Lis River. At the Lis River you have a very important and interesting flax museum about the flax trade, where you learn that, for instance, the one dollar bill is made out of flax, or has at least flax in it. And uh, an absolute must to uh, do when you're in uh, Kortrijk is take a selfie with the Brultorens, which were, which were uh, defense gates. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this little visit and maybe explore on your own. All right. Well, Nico, I certainly enjoyed the visit. And thank you again so much. I don't think that we've ever had a guest that has filmed as much original content for us as you have. So I really enjoyed getting that glimpse um, at some lesser known sites in, in Flanders. Um, we're going to get to questions in just a second, but first we have our word from our sponsor. Tonight, of course, that is the Belgium Guidebook. It is hot off the presses. Um, the most updated version just came out last month, um, so be sure to pick this up if you are hoping to go to Flanders or the rest of Belgium sometime soon. All right, Nico, we have some questions. I'm it's amazing. We covered such a small province, but there was so much to talk about. Um, we went we went a little longer than usual. Uh, so thank you to all of you who stuck around. And we have some questions for Nico now. Um, so Nico, Kathleen has a question. Kathleen is wondering, we said a few times the term the low countries. What do we mean when we say the low countries? So the low countries is a term which um, basically synony synonymous a little bit with the Netherlands. So it's countries that are low-lying lands. 
Um, it's a term that was used in a time when uh, what is now Belgium, the Netherlands, north of France, Luxembourg, parts of Germany, were some kind of semi-entity uh, of, of the counties and the duke, duchies, and so on. So there was a term called the low countries because there were low-lying lands. And it's now still used to refer to a geographical area that covers the Benelux, which is Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, but also parts of northern France, like Dunkirk, for instance, or parts of Germany uh, that connects to the border. So it's a geographical term that also has some historical meaning, but it's the low-lying uh, countries. Nico, we also talked about how influential Bruges was in trade and artistic development. And Leon is wondering, what are some popular artists that come from Bruges or, you know, spent part of their life in Bruges? Yeah, so we have uh, a quite a lot of artists who came from different places to come to Bruges because that's where the money was and the jobs. And one of them is Hans Memling, which um, normally has a museum in Bruges, but it's now under renovation until December. What's worth uh, visiting when you come to Bruges, maybe next year. Um, Hans Memling, but also Van Eyck, Jan Van Eyck, who painted the Adoration of the Mystic Lamb, which is uh, something that you can see in Ghent, um, which has the castle of the Counts of Flanders. So uh, that's another province, Ghent, but we can do a whole episode on that as well. <laughs> um, so Van Eyck would uh, have come to uh, Rohir van der Weide. These are difficult names to pronounce, but uh, some of you who visited uh, the Burgundy region, Dijon, Beaune, uh, Burgundy was united with Flanders for four generations of rulers. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so uh, the artists that you see there, this is this is this that peri period of the Flemish primitives. Uh, it's it's a collective name for a group of painters who who then were were quite famous at the time. This is before Rubens or Anthony van Dijk, which which came later. Um, understandably, Nico, a few people are interested in visiting this region after this presentation. Um, and have some kind of logistical questions. Carol is wondering, how is the public transportation throughout Flanders? Is it fairly easy to get places with train and bus, or should people consider renting a car? Um, I think it's uh, the, 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 the uh, interesting part of, of visiting this area of Belgium is that um, you can get everywhere with public transportation. Mm -hmm. uh, apart from maybe the Flanders Fields region, because the uh, interesting sites that we that that have to do that deal with the first world war the, the cemeteries you could get there with buses but it's time consuming so the best is to either have a uh, book a local guide with a minivan or book a, a side trip from bruges to get to the flanders fields area or if you're fit you can also go and stay at a farm in the area and rent a bike and do all these things by bike. You know, it's something that a lot of locals do. Uh, we we it's it, they have very great bike trails, and our mountains are only a thousand feet high, so it's <laughs> not like it's uh, it's difficult. You know, we're very flat. We also have Linda who is wondering. Um, We've been hearing a lot of reports of places like in the Netherlands that are much more going cashless these days. People are just paying with credit cards or even, you know, with their phones, and there are fewer ATMs. Um, what's the situation like in Belgium these days or in, in the Flanders region specifically in regards to payment methods? Yeah, it's very similar to the Netherlands. Um, we uh, we already were a bit of a front runner when it comes to paying cashless, uh, compared to maybe neighboring countries like Germany or Switzerland, where they still pay a lot of cash. But I think the pandemic also helped uh, speed up the fact that you pay everywhere with uh, your credit cards. Of course, if you go to a local market, if you happen to be in a town where there's a daily market, you or maybe the local in, in the Flanders Fields area, maybe the local bakery uh, or the local uh, grocery store 
doesn't doesn't accept cards. And some French fry stands, well, the the, the Flemish fry stands. Uh, although no, I think in general you can easily uh, travel without that much cash money, uh, and it's quite difficult to actually find ATM machines sometimes. You know. Well, if I need cash to pay for my Flemish fries, I will hunt down an ATM machine if I have to. <laughs> um, Nico, we have time for one last question. Uh, tonight's last question comes from Susie. And Susie wants to know, what are you most proud about of your homeland, of the Flanders region? What are either what are you most pr proud about or what what do you most love about that region? Um, I think it's quite typical for someone from Belgium to not be patriotic at all or not be proud or we're just, maybe that's a little bit, um, sad because other countries who are much prouder have more visitors and more people know about it because they constantly talk about how great they are. You know, we're, we're in between flat France and the Netherlands, both, both countries love boasting about how great their country <laughs> is. Um, but I think I think the food and the um, you know just the the fact that the food is actually really something that you cannot uh, uh, underestimate. Mm -hmm. So if you wherever you go, you'll find great places to eat. You just need to take your time, uh, not rush. Uh, we don't eat as late as the French, but definitely not as early as the Dutch. And um, uh, it's we're we're in. I think we're the great thing is we've been conquered by so many different nations and cultures that there is a very nice mix. Yeah. So it's not really France, it's not really the Netherlands, it's not really Germany, it's not really England, but you have influences from all these surrounding areas, and they're all kind of a melting pot. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe that's what I'm uh, most proud of. That it somehow uh, works to mix. Belgium is a, a delicious sampler platter, both literally and metaphorically. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Good way of well, saying it. Thank you, Nico, for giving us a sampling just of West Flanders tonight, of giving us an insight into your home region, and again, for providing such excellent content for us. It really was a pleasure. Um, we thank you so much for being here with us. Okay, well, it was my pleasure. I think this is the first time Kortrijk is ever mentioned in a <laughs> show in the U.S. But uh, there you go, thank Ball. you for allowing us to uh, show uh, other parts, you know. Breaking down barriers here on Monday Night Travel. Yes. All right. Thank you very much, Nico. And thank you to all of you for joining us. Um, again, we will be off next week. We hope that you enjoy your Memorial Day. Um, and we will be back on June 5th with Rick talking about his recent travels. Be sure to sign up for that. And then the Monday Night Travel Team will step back in the ring on June 12th for a destination duel between Prague and Budapest. So we hope that you will join us for those. I'm going to finish the rest of my Biscoff cookie, and I wish all of you a my good beer night. Is empty, so. Good night, Nico. Bye. Good night, Ben. Good night, Gabe. Good night, Nico. Good night, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>